So I'm really excited to be joined today by Shane Claiborne for this conversation. Before I give the, the overview of Shane's bio that you probably read uh, when you signed up for this webinar, I wanna say a bit of um, my getting to meet Shane. I was in Philadelphia last month and Shane had said, stop by. I knew he does this. No, he does this workshop, has this workshop where guns are broken down and transformed into garden tools. Um, and I was really excited to see that, but I had, I just couldn't have imagined how much more I would be um, in for in watching what he's he and others are helping build in the middle of Kensington, Philadelphia, kind of a down and out, smells a little bit like urine still on the street. But, uh, you know, I walked into this area and, and I want to talk, we're going to talk about this today. But so I walked into this neighborhood and into his workshop and um, got to see, uh, you know, community gardens and houses being fixed up for people in the neighborhood so that it, at a price that they could afford and a health clinic and um, food pantry, uh, take what you need and, and give what you can and kids on the street saying hello to him. And I just, well, all my staff knows because I came back and just said, oh my God, this is, this is the building of beloved community um, in action in action. So Shane Claiborne is a um, Christian activist and best-selling author. He worked with Mother Teresa in Calcutta and founded The Simple Way in Philadelphia, which we're going to be one of the things we're going to be talking about. He heads up Red Letter Christians, uh, which is about bringing together folks who are committed to living the actual words of Jesus. Uh, it's described as, as if Jesus meant the things that he said, and of course we know that he did. He's a champion um, for the homeless, for people uh, opposing war and for veterans. Uh, he and his wife, Katie Jo, turned a small workshop in the Kensington, Philadelphia neighborhood into a blacksmithing sanctuary where guns can literally be turned into plowshares or garden tools. I encourage you, and I'm going to have one of my colleagues put in the chat uh, links to, uh, well, there's many of them, but links to his books. And let's especially uh, put in the chat Beating Guns, his newest book, Rethinking Life, Embracing the Sacredness of Every Person, and uh, Red Letter Revolution. And with that, I'd like to welcome Shane Claiborne. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, good to be with you. Good to see all of you. I've I've uh, loved the work of uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation for many years, so it's always a gift to be together. Yeah, thank you. So I wanted to, we, we have these conversations once a month. It's called Gathering Voices, where we have an informal conversation. Um, and I, I like to begin it by what what was your upbringing like and how did what was the catalyst that started to transform you well i grew up down here in east tennessee where i am I, i'm calling in from today i'm hanging out with my family in the foothills of the smoky mountains my grandparents grew up uh right in the same area as Dolly Parton. In fact, if I were in my other room over there, I've got a picture that says, to Shane, love Dolly Parton. And uh, that's my my people from down here. I fell in love with Jesus here in the Bible Belt. I uh, grew up Methodist and, and still embraced much of my Methodist roots. But then I got involved in the Pentecostal kind of charismatic church movement. Uh, I, there's always some bones to spit out, but I kept leaning into Jesus and I wanted to study sociology. So I went to Eastern University where Tony Campolo, uh, who's a wonderful sociologist and, and also a very powerful preacher, he became my, my friend and my mentor in college. Uh, and I, so I graduated from Eastern University back in the 1900s, uh, <laughs> 1997. And uh, in my in my sophomore year, that's that's when I got involved in uh, the work in North Philadelphia, and that that came from 
a group of poor and homeless families that were squatting out in abandoned Catholic cathedral. So these were moms and children that were uh, on the waiting list for housing, and they moved into this old abandoned Catholic church and started living there. Uh, and sadly, the Catholic archdiocese was uh, trying to evict them. And so they gave them a, a 48 hour notice that if they weren't out, they could be arrested for trespassing on the church's abandoned sanctuary. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's what uh, sparked the movement that I was a part of as a student. We, we um, started a stu student solidarity movement and uh, moved into that cathedral, uh, started building community around that neighborhood 25 years ago. We, we're having our 25th anniversary celebration uh, in a, a little over a month. And we've been kind of building this little village there for the last uh, 25 years. Wow. <laughs> if you can describe a bit for us, um, what does Kensington look like? And um, what a few um, things that have happened in the past 25 years. Uh -huh. Uh, like some of the gardens, and I know you're putting in a community a performance space, performance and art space. Uh, yeah, so, uh, well, the, I mean, our roots were in solidarity with, with homeless families. Uh, and uh, hey, Mark, I think we we hear you there. Yeah, we got a few, few folks on uh, my mute there. Um, I've got a little background noise. So um, yeah, so we we started in that neighborhood, which if you if you took an aerial view of North Philadelphia, Kensington, um, it was uh, where the hub of our factories were. So uh, there were jobs everywhere. There was usually, you know, the the factory and the church and the school was like these little little towns and uh, those factories moved out we lost a hundred thousand jobs we've got uh, 700 abandoned factories 30,000 abandoned houses so I always say if you believe in resurrection this is the perfect place to live uh, and that's what we do we bring abandoned space back to life we 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 like to say we love people back to life um, and there's a lot of economic devastation that's happened, disinvestment that's happened over the decades. Uh, and there's a lot of um, really creative things that people do to try to make it. Um, and some of those are beautiful, um, you know, grilling pinchos out on the street, barbecuing and making some money, scrapping metal, uh, doing selling water on street corners. Uh, it's what a lot of folks do in our neighborhood. And then there's also the drug economy and all the things that are much less uh, uh, life-giving. And, and, and so we're trying to create alternatives to that. And that's why we're building affordable housing. We're uh, built this new community center that our, our friends did at Esperanza Health Center where there's a gym and a cafe with good nutritious food. And there's uh, space for people to work out and exercise their bodies and have support groups for young families and uh, support groups for folks that are in recovery. So uh, it's very comprehensive and holistic. And I love my neighborhood. I think it's obvious the things that are um, yet to be redeemed and the economic history that's there. Um, uh, but, you know, sometimes people in Philadelphia call our neighborhood Kensington, uh, the Badlands. And uh, as a Christian, I always say, you better be careful if you call any place the Badlands, because that's what they called Nazareth. Uh, people said nothing good could come from there. And look who showed up. Uh, that's where God showed up and in Jesus. And that's also where I see God continue to show up all the time uh, in the neighborhoods that we might be prone to move out of. That's where God seems to be moving into and showing up over and over. So it's been a great place to call home for 20 years. But um, we also have a lot of gun violence. And that's where I think some of this conversation started. Um, where, uh, well, in the past few years, Philadelphia has had more lives lost to guns than um, ever in the history of Philadelphia. And that's been true around the, the country. We've uh, now seen gun violence become the number one cause of death of our children. More than cancer or car accidents or anything else, uh, guns are taking those lives. So it's a part of what we do. It's great to see y'all on the on the chat, by the way. Um, 
I have a little bit of a wild attention brain, so you'll. Uh, it's great to see. You know, uh, Carol Green was a, a part of my formation growing up, and Catholic workers that are on there. But all these folks, you know, have really helped to shape me and my passion for peace, for reconciliation, for the holy work of uh, uh, trying to build a world free of violence. That's at the heart of Fellowship of Reconciliation. Um, comes out of that neighborhood. And so I think it's helpful to paint the picture a little bit of what we're doing on the ground um, because all this other work to end the death penalty for restorative justice and alternatives to mass incarceration, to counter the forces of gentrification in our neighborhood, to work to, uh, you know, uh, to alternatives to uh, militarized and, and violent policing in our neighborhoods. All that's like very intersectional um, and overlaps, but it also emerges from my place and from my neighborhood. Um, and so I'm sure I'll talk more about that. But I, you know, it, it was seeing too many lives lost to gun violence that began to fuel our work to turn guns into garden tools and also to really concretely uh, address the crisis of gun violence among the many other things, you know, the recovery community, the all the other stuff, but the gun violence is what I'm putting a lot of energy into this year is trying to save some lives uh, that are lost to guns. Yeah, and for for anyone who is wondering how um, I got connected to Shane recently, he's long been in touch with Fellowship of Reconciliation, but it was the work that we did jointly um, calling for uh, Mother's Day to be declared a national day of reconciliation and repentance and change to end gun violence. Um, could you describe a little bit more? It was incredible to see in person and anybody in Philadelphia, I encourage you to we'll put this in the chat soon uh, to a link to where to go to see the stuff online or in person. But if you're in Philadelphia, I encourage you to stop by and look at this um, swords into plowshares. Oh, how many guns and what do you do to break them down? Well, so uh, about midway into the you know the 25 years in philly we began to um do this work of turning guns into garden tools and uh there's the 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 maybe not so subtle connection to the prophets micah and isaiah that talk about beating swords into plows and spears into pruning hooks uh and learning violence and war no more um so uh Interestingly enough, it wasn't just the gun violence on our corners that inspired that, but the war in Iraq and Afghanistan at the time. And it was the 10th anniversary of 9-11 that I teamed up with my friend Ben Cohen, who you might know, you might know as the Personally. ice cream man, the, the Ben of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Uh, but we uh, took uh, our first donated gun, which was an AK-47, a weapon of war that's still legal on the streets uh, of America. And we, we had one of those that was donated and we turned it into a shovel and a rake. And it was, we did that kind of live on stage as a part of a, a whole event where we dropped Ben and Jerry's ice cream from helium balloons. Uh, I mean, it was just absolutely magical. Um, and the whole thing was around imagining a world with more ice cream and less bombs. Um, and, and so we, you know, had testimonials from folks that lost their loved ones in 9-11 that also became moral voices against the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we had veterans for peace, others that were a part of that entire 90-minute um, kind of live show that we then began to do in many different manifestations. But that was the first gun that we uh, uh, transformed, and it was so powerful that we kept doing it. And we, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years have become known as raw tools, which is war flipped backwards, just in case you missed it. And uh, so we're flipping war around, but we're also flipping weapons around and repurposing metal that's been crafted to kill into metal that's been cultivated for life. And uh, just to give you a little visual of that, this is uh, one of our shovels that's made out of uh, a gun and actually the the wood stock is made out of the uh the that makes the handle so this handle is made out of the wood stock of the gun the the um 
tool itself is made out of the barrel of the gun and we make all kinds of other stuff. But I tell my evangelical friends, uh, you know, that we, we talk about being born again. And I say, this is what it looks like when a gun gets born again. And part <laughs> of what, you know, I, I think the best of our tradition uh, in evangelicalism in which I grew up is that all things can be made new. Uh, you know, people can are more than the worst thing that they've ever done, which is why I'm against the death penalty is because I believe even someone who has killed another person is more than a murderer. They're still made in the image of God and any heart can be transformed from what it was into something new. Uh, metal can be recrafted. Our streets can be reimagined. So I didn't mean to get to preaching here, but uh, there we go. Oh, that's preach, that's preach, how we got preach. going. Yeah. So and, and just last year we did. Um, you said how many, I, I think we did, you know, oh, well over a thousand guns last year that we've chopped up and transformed. Uh, there's now a national network. In fact, this month is Gun Violence Awareness Month, and we're doing 44,000 minutes of blacksmithing this month um, in, in sort of a blacksmithing marathon uh, to blacksmith one minute for every life that was lost uh, last year. So that 44,000 is a, is a heartbreaking number, but it's also a part of what we're doing this month to address it. And sometimes we say uh, transforming the metal is the easy work uh, because we, we also are about addressing the core roots of our infatuation with violence, uh, the roots of violence in America I mean, uh, I mean, this is a part of the founding sins of our country. You just can't imagine America without guns and without violence, uh, being built on stolen land with stolen labor. Uh, so this is a very big problem that's more than just uh, uh, the guns themselves. But they do, I think, are one particular manifestation of our sickness uh, when it comes to violence. So it is powerful. And part of what we do all over the country is craft events that center people who have been impacted by violence. And uh, that's folks that have lost their loved ones. Um, there's a picture actually in the chat for those that can see it of uh, one of the first handguns that we transformed in Philadelphia. Incidentally, we found in one of the abandoned houses we're fixing up. So literally this just kind of shows how saturated we are with guns. We found one laying in an abandoned house and we invited the moms and dads who had lost their children to beat on the gun. And this one mother that some of us can see a picture of there in the chat, she, as she was beating on it, she said, this is for my boy. And when Miss Ryans was beating on that gun, it felt like not only is she transforming a piece of metal, but she's really proclaiming and participating uh, in, in the transformation of the world, you know, that all things can be made different. And uh, so now we've done that, you know, we do that work all over the country. Uh, uh, and, and the guns are just kind of a symbol of that. But we, uh, we use a church word for it, which is that this is a sacrament. And in our, in my, you know, my Christian tradition, that that means holy mystery, right? So there's something holy that happens as we transform metal, but also as people beat on that. So we've seen folks that have lost their loved ones, but we've also seen folks who have been perpetrators of violence, um, folks who have experienced violence in war as uh, veterans of combat. Um, one young man uh, in California, he beat on the gun barrel and counted out loud 18 times, one, two, three, all the way to 18, and then he kind of collapsed. And he said, uh, I took the life of an 18 year old. Uh, and so I'm praying that God would, you know, heal my own heart. So it really is sacramental. It really is holy. And the guns are kind of a symbol of that, but it's a much more uh, kind of all encompassing work that we're trying to do to heal the world of violence and why we love, you know, folks like FOR to partner with as we do that. I can't help asking then when you first heard about uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I I think when we started, I mean, really early on, uh, the simple way, which is my local community in North Philadelphia, 
we heard about Fellowship of Reconciliation. I mean, um, we had roots with the Catholic Worker Movement, with War Resisters, with the Berrigan, you know, the uh, the, the Berrigan Brothers and others in the Plowshares Movement. Um, so those are our roots, even Koinonia Farm, you know, and some of these places that overlap with your own history. Um, and we've always known that there's something fresh that's happening today, but it also has deep roots and we need to like look back as we're moving forward. In fact, sometimes we talk about it kind of like being in a rowboat, you know, we need to look back and see where we've come from as we move into the next uh, season of resistance and of, of, of peacemaking in our world. So you talk about, you, you just mentioned, uh, I love uh, this analogy that um we, we're fresh things are are growing and also have deep roots and that's certainly um, something we're we're excited about at for um, continuing the resistance well well uh, feeling our roots so you know nothing has deeper roots and yet fresh uh, energy than faith right mm. than, than all of our faiths so I want to move into a little bit about uh, what red letter Christians is and you know you talk about, um, I want to ask you about what you think, you know, or, or how you interpret uh, what Jesus says, what Jesus said, and how that gets misinterpreted, um, especially here in America. Yeah. Well, it was uh, some year, it was several years ago that uh, there was a, it was actually down here in Tennessee, it was a secular Jewish country music dj so that's a whole lot to kind of wrap your head around secular jewish country music dj in nashville interviewing uh a friend of mine um jim wallace you may know from sojourners he was interviewing jim and he said you know he kind of confessed i i've read a lot of the bible and there's parts of it that i love but there's if i'm honest there's parts of it that i don't love you know that i find kind of confusing or even troubling um, and he said, but I've always liked the stuff in red. And he was talking about the Bibles that have the words of Jesus highlighted in red and many of the, the Bibles. And he said, I love the red stuff. And he said, you guys <laughs> seem to like the red letters. You should call yourselves red letter Christians. And that's where our name came from. Um, and, you know, Mahatma Gandhi was once asked about Christianity and he said, I love Jesus. I just wish the Christians acted more like him. And I think for many of us, that's kind of where uh, we began to see that we need to distinguish ourselves from some of the things that uh, uh, so th that call themselves Christian but don't look very Christ-like at all. And, um, and, and the word Christian, as you may know, means Christ-like, and yet much of what uh, suffices as Christianity is not Christ-like or loving at all. Um, Several years ago, the Barner Research Group went to every state in the United States and they asked young non-Christians, what do you think of when you hear the word Christian? The number one answer was anti-gay, anti-homosexual, number one. Number two was judgmental and number three was hypocritical. And I'll stop there because the list doesn't get much better. <laughs> uh, but what also broke my heart is what people didn't say. Um, people didn't say love, which is the very top thing that Jesus said, they will know that you are Christians by your love or the fruit of the spirit, you know, uh, kindness, goodness, gentleness, uh, joy, peace, right? Those are the things that scripture says God is like. Those are the fruits of God's spirit. Um, so, you know, as my friend Richard Rohr likes to say, the best critique of what's wrong is the practice of something better. So we, we've always said we want, to, we want to live out a version of Christianity that does look like Jesus again. Um, and when it comes to guns, I mean, this was very evident. We wrote a book called Beating Guns, and Christians are the highest gun-owning demographic in America. Uh, yep. White evangelicals in particular are the biggest champions of guns in our country, uh, and, and many of those folks would say that they're also pro-life. And we like to say, you can't be pro-life and pro-guns. You can't be pro-life and pro-death penalty. Like these are a contradiction. And pro-life doesn't just mean being anti-abortion. It means championing life on every front. Uh, so that's what we're kind of after. 
And so over the last 10 years or so, we've been forming uh, a movement uh, around this idea of red letter Christianity. And you, I'll put our website in the chat there, but um, there's so many folks that um, are a part of that. And it's really just a coalition. We, we, we say that we're a web of subversive friends and uh, that love Jesus and love justice. And we're really good collaborators with people who are not Christians, who uh, have other faiths or no faith in particular. Um, we're partners with groups like the Poor People's Campaign, um, and Reverend Barber, you know, the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, um, has been a really dear friend and mentor. And one of the things that he says is the way that we change the narrative around Christianity is by changing the narrators and by centering uh, voices that are not um, uh, the, the loudest, most toxic voices, but the voices of liberating uh, good news uh, justice-oriented Christianity. And so we've got hundreds and hundreds of folks on our website and dozens of, we call them co-conspirators. And if we don't have FOR on there, we should. You know, it's groups like yours that we're we're trying to build that movement alongside. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're, we're just glad. I think it's an amazing time to be alive. And um, there is a far bigger landscape of Christianity than the white evangelicalism that has often kind of monopolized and hijacked the airwaves. And, you know, even as we think of the 80% of white evangelicals who supported Donald Trump, what's really interesting is we miss a whole part of the picture, which is 80% of non-white, black and Latino and other Christians were obstacles and confronting the rhetoric and policies of Donald Trump. I mean, Black women in particular have been a moral conscience, and many of them, uh, faith is at the very heart of what they're doing. So I think we're, we're very careful not to allow the kind of white evangelicalism to colonize the entire spiritual landscape of what God's doing in our country. And certainly the Poor People's Campaign and Dr. King and so many others have really helped, I think, have a healthier framework for what Christianity really looks like. So FOR is, uh, we're an interfaith organization. I'm our first non-Christian uh, executive director. And um, I want to ask about faith communities and, and institutions, you know, so beyond Christianity, so Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, and so on, all of which have this problem of fusing nationalism and, and faith, certainly in my Jewish community a daily, daily challenge to uh, confront. Um, but so what role do you think these traditions, our many faith traditions, uh, have to play in terms of engaging younger generations in faith activism, activism combined, faith combined with activism, especially in this moment, right, where we see younger generations less and less identifying uh, with a specific faith tradition, I don't want to say, um, are not people of faith. But um, in polling, you know, we see that identification uh, reducing. And how do we reach um, that audience? Uh, well, it's such an important question. And uh, I'm not quite as young as I used to be. I guess none of us are, but I, I will look say pretty young. <laughs> I, I get to hang out with a lot of young people. And, um, and what I see over and over is um, that th they are less interested in religion that is just about theology and ideas that are disconnected to the world that we live in. Um, and certainly Christianity has often been about escaping uh, earth, you know, and going to heaven when we die. Um, I think we do a lot of work to correct that because Jesus, you know, talks all the time about the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. And we say this is about bringing God's dream and God's justice and God's peace on earth, not just going to heaven when we die. But I think a lot of faiths have created ideologies and um, uh, theology that disconnects from the world that we live in right now. And all faiths have been distorted and used to camouflage hatred and bigotry. 
Uh, I mean, I saw, I've seen the Jewish expressions of that. I mean, you only, you go in the, you know, Ibrahimic mosque in Hebron and you can see the bullet holes in the walls as Muslims were shot in the middle of prayer there. Uh, we certainly are very familiar with the forms of distorted versions of Islam that lead people to do terrible violence and Christianity is no exception. I mean, we've often camouflaged hatred uh, in the form of racial terrorism and lynching and people blowing up abortion clinics and, I mean, any number of things that Christians have done to baptize bombs and war and colonization. So um, I particularly am working, as Jesus said, to get the log out of my own eye <laughs> and out of my own faith traditions eye. So I wrote a book. Uh, my most recent book is called Rethinking Life that um, is really about these two competing narratives of Christianity, one that has been deadly um, and the other one that has been championing life. Uh, and even at different points in history of the Holocaust, of um, uh, the Crusades, there was, the, and, and certainly of the, the colonization of native land, the uh, you know, the, the slave trade, there were Christians that had two very different versions of Christianity. Uh, <laughs> and as Frederick Douglass said, one of them looked like Jesus and one of them didn't. <laughs> and, and so I think I, I'm, but I'm also very interested in collaborating with people of other faiths. And that's why, you know, at the Parliament of World Religions, we'll be bringing the forge and melting guns down uh, and honoring the fact that Christianity isn't the only religion that has been hijacked by hatred and people that have tried to twist the cross into a swastika or into a, a, a weapon um, to, to um, sort of hide their own hatred. Um, uh, but I, you know, I think that young people, they want a revolution. They, want, they don't just want a theology statement um, and they want to change the world. And I believe that there are versions of my faith and uh, that can be a fuel and a foundation for that kind of holy work of uh, racial justice and reparations and, um, and confronting uh, white supremacy and violence and the justification of violence. So I lean on uh, my tradition and what I've learned from other people of faith uh, in different traditions as we do that work. Um, and th another thing I would say is that it's not just institutional religion that young people are kind of um, exhausted uh, by, but it's also, I think, a lack of um, a, a lack of um, trust in the government institutions. Um, there's a great article in the Atlantic called "How Will This Generation Change Washington When They Hate It So Much." And you look at the Supreme Court and things like the Electoral co College and the two-party system, and most young people that I know are really fed up with the, polaris, uh, the, the polarities and also the lack of ability to get really basic things done, like immigration control, um, like uh, ending the death penalty. I mean, immigration reform, finding you know a path to citizenship. Uh, also, like things like ending the death penalty, doing something around gun violence. Um, and some of us would think that that's a, a you know, just a, a problem on the right. But um, I think um, a lot of young people think it's it's a, a problem uh, that involves both. And I mean, for instance, we're trying to get Joe Biden to tear down the federal execution chamber in Terre Haute, Indiana, a building that is designed for one purpose, to kill people. Uh, mm -hmm. And he has the power to do it. We've talked at all levels of the administration. And so we're like, if you can't afford the bulldozer, we will pay for it, but we need to tear that building down. So just things as simple as that, you know, we want to see them get done. And uh, I think it's groups like FOR and, you know, Red Letter Christians and others, all of us working together that can put that fire under, uh, you know, the, the seat of our politicians to do something. Um, yeah. And military spending, right? I mean, good heavens, like uh, uh, George Bush raised the 
the uh, military budget, but then Obama raised his budget, and then Trump raised Obama's budget, and then Biden raised uh, Trump's budget. So we've got the highest military spending we've ever had in history once again. And this is not a partisan thing. It's not a left or right thing. I think it's it's a it's a right it's a right and wrong thing. And we want to be on the side of peace. So we're going to move to questions from the audience shortly, but I can't help it. I'm going to start with one from myself that I, I'm known for being unable to <laughs> to have a full conversation without touching on uh, the situation in Palestine and Palestinians. And my uh, dear friend and sweetheart, Jim Zogby is on. And if Jim, if you want to come on camera and say hello, I know Jim has been on a panel with you, Shane, on uh, the Middle East and is an expert on uh, all things Palestine. But uh, one of the things that we're watching grow right now that um, Jewish Americans are very cognizant of right now is the strengthening of the relationship between um, Christian nationalists, American Christian nationalists, and Jewish Israeli Zionists, like the, the you know, just a convergence um, in the Holy Land of a very unholy um, alliance. And I'd love to know if you have any thoughts on that or of thoughts on how to confront it and um, be an obstacle in the way of that, of that, that unholy alliance. Yeah, are you, are you asking me or are you asking? I'm uh, asking you, folks? sorry, I'm oh, asking okay. you. That yeah, was yeah. kind of a long ramble there and. Uh... <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm sure glad to, to um, cede my time to some of the folks that are in, you know, uh, in, in the, the troubled Holy Land region. Um, but I've been over there, you know, many times we've, uh, for a while we had a, a conference there called Christ at the Checkpoint that was also sort of nodding at the fact that if Jesus had made uh, that original journey that he made in the Gospels, he would get stuck at the wall. Um, and, and that Jesus was uh, and is a brown-skinned, Palestinian, Jewish, refugee familiar with the violence and the and entering into the pain and struggle of the human condition and so um uh you know i've learned a lot from listening and i most of the time when i go to the middle east i listen and i've been to, to iraq i've been to afghanistan i've been to jordan and you know all over there but particularly being in iraq and afghanistan i mean in in uh israel and palestine it's just heartbreaking right to see um the most sophisticated apartheid system uh, that we've ever seen. Um, my friend Sammy Awad, uh, who is part of Red Letter Christians, and we've done a bunch of stuff together, um, he often tells me his story as a, as a Palestinian Christian um, of when he went to um, Germany on a pilgrimage, really a spiritual pilgrimage, um, to better understand the violence that was inflicted on Jewish people and the anti-Semitism that is um, far too prevalent and poisonous all over the world today. Um, and he talks about going to Auschwitz and to seeing the Holocaust memorials. And he said he came back with this deep grief in solidarity with, Jewish, uh, with the Jewish community. Um, and he said, now I look at the wall and I don't see hatred, I see fear. And it's a fear that has roots in history. And he said, now that, that doesn't justify the injustices and the violence that we see now targeting Palestinian people. But I think it says, wherever human lives are being crushed, God's image is being crushed and that matters. And so we should do everything we can to stand against anti-Semitism. And we should do everything we can to stand uh, up for the sacredness of Palestinian lives. Um, and the Palestinian folks that I know now, what's less important than if it's one state or two states is, is that every Palestinian life is seen as equally valuable and sacred and precious as every life on the other side of, of the wall. Um, and I know that there are lots of questions, lots of ideas about what could form peace. Um, and uh, 
you know, I've written about that. I've listened to a lot of folks and tried to amplify the folks that are there in Israel and Palestine working for peace, groups like the Tent of Nations that inspire me, you know, every day. Those those stories of everyday peacemakers are incredible. Um, in our in our shop where we're melting down guns, we have tear gas canisters from Bethlehem, right? That Palestinian families gathered from the streets and make Christmas ornaments all, uh, out of, um, you know, nodding to the fact that where this violence is happening is exactly the very roots of the birth of Jesus and the foundation of the Christian faith. And, and so all of us should be grieved as we see what's happening there. Um, and uh, uh, so that, those are just, you know, a few thoughts. Um, and, you know, plenty others on the Christian nationalism and the way that distorted theology. There's a whole role that, you know, theology of the end times and all this gets really uh, wrapped up in what's happening there right now. But anyway, I think that's enough. But uh, yeah, a few thoughts. So, um, welcome, Jim. And I'm going to uh, hand it to you for the next question, whether you want that to be about the Middle East, a continuation of this, or um, Jesus. And uh, please, and then I'm going to compile a couple of questions uh, for folks. Okay. I think I did. Yes. Um, Shane, we met once, I think we were on a panel together with, uh, there was Tony Campola and um, Mitri Rahib. Um, Good to see you. Yeah. yeah. Good to see you. Uh, I have a question. Um, I get it all the time. I've been doing this work for, for 50 years and it's a struggle. And uh, sometimes I lose hope and I, um, and I deal with it, but I wanted to ask you, you sound so upbeat, so positive, so hopeful, so inspiring. Are there times you lose hope? Um, and when you do, what do you do to shake out of it? Oh, well, that's that's a really uh, profound and wonderful question. Um, I mean, part of what I do is I beat the crap out of an AR-15 uh, on a weekly basis. <laughs> Um, I mean, honest to goodness, beating on the guns is symbolic, but it's also a part of healing. And 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 there, there's a type of therapeutic role uh, that it plays. Uh, but I, I think that I get so much energy and deep faith and hope from uh, my neighborhood, from people who have survived so much. Um, and I mean, even... I visit a lot of folks on death row, which you would think would be one of the most hopeless places in the world, but that's not at all what I've found. I've, I've found that there's this deep sense um, of, of really defiant, defiant hope and joy that isn't based on the circumstances or evidence, but this sense that there is a God that is with us, no matter how this story ends. Um, and I see that in my neighborhood all the time. Um, when the whenever the stock market is collapsing, my neighbors get one of my neighbors said, no matter happen, what happens on Wall Street, God is still good. And our people have been in a recession for a few hundred years and God has never left us. So it is about where we put our hope. And my hope is not in Wall Street. My hope is not in America. Uh, my hope isn't in uh, any you know, capitalist systems or economies or the military might of, uh, of uh, you know, the United States. But my hope is in this baby refugee <laughs> who was executed on a cross. And that changes everything. I mean, it changes the way I think about violence and um, what it looks like to win. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've always loved that old hymn, Jim, uh, uh, my hope uh, is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. All other ground is sinking sand. Or for those maybe outside of the Christian world, I love that song, uh, this hope that I have, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. So I'm not going to give people the power to take my hope uh, because my hope isn't based on um, the circumstances that we're up against. I mean, part of my hope is built on what we've made it through. Um, and what our ancestors made it through and what um, African, African Americans have made it through and the role that hope played in, uh, and their faith played in getting, giving them the strength to make it through, even what Christians were doing um, uh, to distort the Christian faith uh, to justify 
such terrible violence. So uh, those are those are a few thoughts on hope. But I, yeah, I like to laugh hard, and I I hang out with people that are hopeful, and they rub off on me. And I think if we hang hang out with people that are cynical. Uh, they rub off on us too. As Tony Campolo, uh, Brother Jim, you'll appreciate this. Uh, Tony always says, we're as young as our dreams and as old as our cynicism. And as one who's almost 90 years old now, he'll, he'll sometimes tell teenagers, I'm younger than some of you because your cynicism is aging you. My my grandmother, my booby, would just say, life is short. And she died at 102, still walking up the stairs of the house. And um, so I'm going to ask the, the next question. I'm going to combine a little bit here. And I'm also going to see if possible, if I can get my dear friend who is just coming on to the Fellowship of Reconciliations National Council, our board, um, as to come on camera if you'd like, Mark Harrison, um, who you may know as well, a real champion for justice. But this is part practical question, and then I'm going to add in a few things as we start to wind down for time. Uh, what first steps might we be able, might we each take to start a gun relinquishment program? And I'm going to invite my colleague Ethan as well to share again uh, what's happening in his community in North Carolina, inspired by your work, Shane. And how do we re help refocus the discourse uh, that the connection, that our, our country's economy is dependent upon the selling, the making um, of guns, both domestically, both those AK, uh, AR-15s, and also the very same guns that are, you know, constantly headed over to Ukraine that are keeping that uh, horrific war there in motion. Um, how do we end our, our addiction uh, to guns? And uh, I want to add into that, it's, it's not unlinked, but somebody <laughs> has a, a question about the opioid uh, crisis and knowing how badly Philadelphia has been impacted. Um, so how can we help lift people out of that suffering at the same time? And of course, all of this, you know, is very connected. Uh, wow. Yeah, you did a great job at linking a whole bunch of things together. I've been having a hard time following the chat, although I'll have to say I love it. I love the uh, interactions and all the little things I'm seeing in the chat, but I I'll do my best to um, do this quickly so we can get to uh, you know anything else you want to. But um, part of the reason that I felt very compelled to write Rethinking Life is because I thought I thought we did need um, a framework that intersects the sacredness of life under all of in all of these different areas. So um, in that book, in, in my newest book, I talk about our response to the opioid crisis. And one of the things that we had was a campaign called Need a Little Help, where we gathered hundreds and hundreds of heroin needles from our streets and from our neighborhood, and we marched them to City Hall, and we delivered them to our public officials um, asking that the heroin crisis be seen as a public health crisis that warrants immediate attention. Um, and we, we've seen that begin to happen. There's still a lot more work to be done, um, but we're doing a whole lot. Um, I, as far as the safe injection sites or the overdose prevention sites, I'm much more interested in trying to stop the supply line of um, of drugs into our neighborhoods um, because it kind of feels like we're bu bucketing out water without turning off the spigot. Um, I'm unconvinced that um, that safe injection sites are like the silver bullet or whatever to this this situation. I think I believe in harm reduction, um, and I believe in in trying to um, uh, see people make gradual steps towards self care. Uh, but I'm not convinced that safe injection sites are. Um, going to solve all of that. We have explored the option of having those connected to all the hospitals in Philadelphia so that they are not just concentrated in one zip code, but that we spread out the recovery community and process throughout the city. Um, uh, but uh, there's things like healthcare right, and resources towards recovery that are also really important. We're trying to build alternatives to mass incarceration so that we don't see addiction as criminal needing jail, but as a sickness needing treatment. Um, 
And, and having said that, it's a massive industry and it's absolutely destroying people's lives. And large pharmaceuticals have, been, have contributed deeply to that, but there's other folks that contribute to that. I mean, the drug economy is not a little economy in North Philadelphia. If you read the New York Times, there's an entire thing called the Walmart of heroin that talks specifically about my zip code. It doesn't show the best of our neighborhood, but it does show the opioid crisis um, and the fact that, I mean, we have dozens of people that are waiting in line for free samples of heroin because they know how addictive it is. So it's being given out fentanyl and heroin in the form of free samples. So that's really messed up. We, we need to not see that happen. Um, and, uh, and it's very, uh, you know, it just destroys people's lives. So um, I, th I think we need more than a law enforcement approach to be perfectly clear. We need all kinds of uh, uh, folks looking at the, the crisis of opioids. And, and uh, so on, the, on the, um, the gun thing, that's a lot easier. If you go to rawtools.org, you can see that we are establishing a safe surrender network. We call it the disarming network. And our hope is to have every few hours uh, uh, from each other driving distance, a safe surrender site in the United States where people can um, uh, get rid of unwanted firearms and have them destroyed. There's a very specific way that we go about that to stay uh, safe and legal. Uh, so we can walk people through that. But we all over the country have metal crafters and blacksmiths that are ready to chop up guns. And we're doing it all the time. In fact, we're now in the 211, the Emergency Response Network of Pennsylvania. So it's kind of like Ghostbusters. It's like Gunbusters. Whenever uh, if, if someone finds a gun in their kid's room and it's like, I don't know what to do with this, who are you going to call? You call us and we'll bring the chop saw. Um, <laughs> we have uh, a lot of terrible incidents. Like a, we had a, a, a homicide and a, a murder where a man killed his family, killed himself. And then they had a house full of guns. So we were uh, thankfully able to chop up all of those guns and make sure that they'll never shoot again. So we're doing that all the time. And we would love new partners. If anyone's listening, you know, and has guns that they want to get rid of, we can help make that happen. Um, there's folks that inherit guns or that rethink firearms in their house that do the research and see that a fire, fire you know, even a pistol in our house doesn't make us safer, um, you know, all that stuff. So we're really glad to help with that. Um, and, uh, and this is also really connected as Martin Luther King says, you know, uh, so poignantly that, you know, he said, and he was a gun owner at one point, but he said, we're not going to win the fight to peace with the, the arms of war, like with the, the weapons. Uh, so he got rid of his guns and he became such a champion for, uh, a consistent ethic of nonviolence, right? That, uh, and he said, you know, I can't, we can't speak against the violence in our ghettos without speaking against the violence of our government, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, the U.S. government. And so, I mean, it's so important that with guns, we are the manufacturer of firearms. We, in the United States, produce uh, nine and a half million guns a year, one gun every three seconds, 26,000 guns uh, every single day. Uh, it's absolutely horrendous. And I think it's also, uh, as a Christian, I would call it a form of idolatry. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're putting our trust and our strength in the firearms. Uh, and it, even in this, this absolutely spiral ideology that more guns will make us safer. Um, and so it becomes this addiction Right. I, I always say it's like a someone that's an alcoholic saying, I've got a problem. I need some whiskey right now. You know, <laughs> and we're doing that with guns. Right. We're going like the only thing that's going to help our guns is more guns. You're like, no, that's not it. Right. Jesus literally said, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Like this is deadly. It's a path to destruction. And it's also true with militarism. You know, companies like Lockheed Martin and Boeing have had contracts with over 150 countries of the world that they've sold arms to. It's like if I was selling guns in my neighborhood and saying, now don't use them, right? Like inevitably the guns and the bombs and the military equipment that we export around the world kills people. And it comes back to kill us. I mean, Saddam Hussein, 
uh, the, the Bell helicopters that he used to gas the Kurds came from the United States. When I was in Iraq, I had Iraqi intellectuals tell me, uh, you know that we have some weapons in Iraq because you have the receipts from those weapons in the United States. And so we also have to grieve, you know, that uh, out of the, you know, almost 200 countries in the world, uh, it's only like what nine countries uh, that have nuclear weapons and uh, two countries, the US and Russia uh, have 90 3% of the nuclear weapons in the world. We have almost half of them. And we're the only country that has ever used them. And we did it twice in one week, right? In Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So like this idea that America is God's messianic force for good in the world is an ideology and a theology and a mythology that needs to be debunked. And we're working hard to do that. Uh, I certainly know that Christians um, have been the strongest advocates for the idea of Christian nationalism. Uh, and so, you know, I've, we've done everything that we can to combat that. Um, and we've gone to jail for, you know, uh, nonviolently resisting and protesting that uh, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of different forms. So I think we got to keep the courage up and courage is contagious. So let's keep doing it. So I'm going to hand over the mic for the last question to my uh, dear friend and FOR, incoming FOR National Council member, Mark Harrison. Mark, welcome. Um, would you like to uh, ask the next and what will be our closing out question? And uh, as you unmute, I'll just also let folks know uh, for those questions like how to start up uh, gun turn in in your community. We're gonna be following up this conversation with sending out resources and links and uh, where to pick up Shane's latest book and all of that stuff. Mark, take it away. Oh, you're muted. Oh, we gotta unmute you though. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Brother Shane, you know I've been following you for years. I remember you came to United Methodist Board of Church and Society Conference uh so i don't remember where it was and you were just a, a great success and young people like you and young people followed you and yeah. i just want to follow up with with this two quick questions if i can how do you engage with the wide the wider movement from a faith perspective on let's say gun violence uh because i know that there are a number of groups from march uh march on our lives and uh the, the communities up in connecticut how do you interact with them at all to spread the message of what you're trying to say about gun violence? And lastly is the question about Tennessee. Mm. How did Tennessee get to where it is today? What were the things that you went into the politics of the state that it has now moved to become what is called a red state, mm. not red Christian state? I just wanna hear your, your, your views on that. Well, I know we're almost out of time, but Brother Mark, it's good to see you. And I, I'll be brief and just say that. Uh, uh, so, by the way, he's from Tennessee originally. Yeah, I am. And I'm not ashamed about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, I, I, a couple of uh, things on the the beginning of that is we cast a really broad uh, tent, a big tent, um, uh, especially when it comes to things like uh, ending the death penalty, death penalty action is uh, a multi-faith and also open to people of no faith um, group. We host, we host vigils around every execution uh, in America. Um, but they're also, and we do direct actions. We do a fast and vigil uh, annually that'll be on the steps of the Supreme Court from June uh, 28th to July 2nd. So just in coming up shortly. Um, and so those are all like, uh, we're, we're stronger together than we are on our own, but we need people singing their own song, right? And a symphony is beautiful because it has lots of different instruments. And so at Red Letter Christians, we talk about harmonizing, but not homogenizing. And uh -huh. so we need that diversity. Um, and uh, I have, I, you know, in my own tradition as a Christian, you know, there's a point where Jesus says, the, uh, the, the disciples come up to Jesus and they say, there's this guy doing miracles and prophecies down the street, but he's not one of us. Should we stop him? And Jesus 
throws it all out there and says, no, if he's not against us, he's for us. So I think as Christians, we can be unashamed about our faith, but that should be uh, make us the best collaborators in the world. And that hasn't always been the case. So with um, the death penalty, a part of why we need a distinctively Christian witness is because we are the biggest part of the problem. White evangelical Christians are the biggest supporters of the death penalty. We're the biggest supporters of guns and militarism. So we, I think we need to talk Bible. We need to talk Jesus uh, as we confront those kind of distorted versions of our own faith. But we also need to be a part of movements that are uh, broader than just Christianity. And even in my neighborhood, I'm not just working with Christians to end gun violence. I'm working with every single person I can. Uh, and if they're not against us, they're for us. And so we're going to work for everybody, uh, no matter who they vote for or what food preference they have or what language they speak or where they're at worshiping uh, God or what name they call God. We want to work together with everybody to save lives. Uh, in Tennessee, I love my state. That's part of what fuels my passion. But I grieve the history of this state that still has residue, right? My high school, Maryville High School, had the Confederate flag on lunchroom trays and on the football field when I went there in 1993, right? So uh, the states that held on to slavery the longest are the same states that still hold on to the death penalty. I mean, Tennessee still has the electric chair. Come on, Dolly Parton. Come on, Amy Grant. We need, we need everybody to raise their voices in this state. But I'm thankful for the, my friend, uh, Brother Justin Jones, right? For uh, Justin J. Pearson, the, these young black uh, legislators that were kicked out of their own legislature for protesting gun violence, and they are fueled by their faith. They are unashamedly Christians. They're working with everybody. But I also love that there is a version of Christianity that is at the very heart and core of Brother Justin Jones in the state legislature in Tennessee as one of the youngest black politicians in this state. And he went to jail protesting the fact that they had the statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest, right? The founder of the KKK was in the Capitol until he got there. So I, I think, you know, that's good religion that we need. And we, we need to call out the bad religion, but we also need to practice the good religion. Uh, so thank you, brother. Thank you. So uh, I'll stop right. there. Right. <laughs> thank you. As we uh, close out, if you would lead us in, uh, it's, a, it's an FOR uh, team tradition that when we start a meeting, unless we forget sometimes, which happens, but when we start a meeting, we begin with a prayer. And uh, when we close out a meeting, we close out with a prayer and we pass it around who, who does those. And um, if you would close us out with a prayer and then I'm gonna, we're gonna try to unmute everybody or we'll let folks unmute themselves. I think it has to be an unmute yourself uh, to join for amen and wave hello. Great, you're telling me I'm doing the benediction yes. here. Is that right? Well, right. I picked right. one out <laughs> that I thought would be perfect for this community. So I had you all in mind. And this is a, a, a benediction or a blessing that we have um, in the link. I put the link there to Common Prayer, which is a really beautiful resource that we've uh, kind of curated. But this is one of the, the blessings that we have. May God bless you with discomfort about easy answers and half truths and superficial relationships so that you may seek truth boldly and love deep within your heart. And may God bless you with holy anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people so that we may tireless, tirelessly work for justice, freedom, and peace. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world so that we are able to do with God's grace that which other people think cannot be done. May it be so. Amen. And anyone who wants to unmute and say amen and wave hello, please go ahead and do so. Thank you so amen. much Thank you for joining us. And uh, we look forward to continuing many, many, many 
years of fruitful and uplifting and energizing, which certainly you've given us today, uh, work together for peace. Absolutely. Bless you. We'll, we'll stay in touch. Dot, dot, dot on this conversation. Thank you. <laughs>